So, it looks like we may or may not be in lockdown uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks. Regardless of the fact, I decided I'm going to grab some water samples, not to drink, but just in case we are quarantined for the next few weeks, I might have some stuff to film living within those water samples. So, come with me. So I'm going to collect these samples in three different spots within a small area just so I could try to have some diversity. If I had it my way, I'd be traveling to different parks or something to really get some good samples, but, you know, it is what it is. I've washed these containers out already, but I always like to do one rinse through just in case. Hopefully there'll be some stuff in there. And I'm being careful not to cross-contaminate the pools. Let's say one pool has the chytrid fungus. I don't want to take the spores from that pool and transfer them to another pool. So I'm not mixing my vessels with different waters and things like that. I'm not putting my feet in the different pools and stuff. And I'm being as careful as I can be. Ostracods are a type of crustacean also called seed shrimp and I really love to find them. They're usually around a millimeter but there's one species, the Gigantocypress, that can actually be 30 millimeters long. Even though they're called seed shrimp, they're not really shrimp but like I said they are crustaceans. A really cool thing about ostracides is their fossil remains are often found in abundance in different types of rocks and minerals. Of course, most of their body decomposes, but their cells often remain behind to become fossilized. So it's really neat looking at the different types of ostracides that have existed throughout the millennia and, you know, millions of years. It's pretty hard to film it, but if you look closely on these seed shrimp, you can see those tiny antennas sticking out from the opening of the shell. They use those as sensory organs, just like anything else with antenna. That's how they gather information about the environment around them, mates, and potential food sources. So this is a clutch of snail eggs, and as you can see, they look really cool when you look at them up close. Snails, of course, are not always an indicator of a healthy water quality, since they can tolerate pretty stagnant waters. Cyclops are another type of crustacean known as copepods. These cyclops are a little over half a millimeter long, but some species can range up to five millimeters long. Females are often easily distinguished from the males because they'll be carrying two sacs filled with eggs towards the rear of their bodies. You can just make this out with your naked eye. You can't see it, but they have five pairs of legs and more than one pair of antenna. The male cyclops will use their longer first pair of antenna to grip the females during mating. At the front of their bodies, you can see their eye. Cyclops, on average, live for about three months. Cyclops are also not exactly indicators of high water quality since they can survive in pretty stagnant waters. They'll feed on plants and carrion and other animal matter. I try to avoid collecting various species of worms, but it's almost impossible. I know very little about the different species of worms, so I'll just move on from here. Of course, like always, there's a lot of mosquito larvae present. They're not really great indicators of water quality because they're actually atmospheric breathers. They go up to the surface film of the water, stick their tail out, which is where they breathe, and grab the air that way. Fly larvae are always an exciting thing to find, especially species such as this one that built their homes out of leaves that they cut up with their mouths and then glue together with sticky strands of silk. 
caterpillars will also construct their homes out of little pebbles and stones that not only camouflage and protect them from predators, but also serve as ballast. And their vegetarian diet consists of algae and other plant matter. You're not going to see these in polluted waters or places with low oxygen. I intend to have a video all about caddis flies in the future. That is a big patch of wood frog eggs. It's got to be wood frogs, I imagine. It's huge. And there's a lot of hatched individuals. I've been careful not to get any tadpoles or polywogs for obvious reasons, but there's just hours, if not days, worth of intriguing things to watch and investigate. Really cool stuff. I'm not sure what species of beetle this is, but I'm pretty sure it's a plaster breather, meaning that it uses a somewhat permanent bubble of air attached to its body to breathe. This is a damselfly larva. While adult damselflies and dragonflies look pretty similar, their larvae are fairly different from each other. Damselflies are longer and thinner looking, and they always have those three feather-like structures at the back of their abdomens. Those feathery tails are actually their gills, and they absorb oxygen straight from the water. These damselfly larvae are rather predaceous, both ambushing and hunting their prey. They have a lower lip with claws on it that shoots out like an arm, grabs their prey, and pulls it back to the mouth. These damselfly nymphs are pretty good indicators on the health of the water system because they need a relatively high amount of oxygen and they're pretty sensitive to toxins. This is a freshwater daphnia, one of my favorite things to find. They are so cool looking, especially when viewed through a microscope or magnifying glass. I love that clear shell. Daphnia can be pretty decent indicators of the water quality since they are relatively intolerant of toxins in the environment. The Daphnia's lifespan can actually average 5 to 10 months. I find that pretty impressive for something so small. Daphnia generally feed on plants, microscopic animals, and carrion. Surprisingly, some Daphnia can actually spontaneously develop helmet-like structures to protect themselves from the pressures of predation. Daphnia are filter feeders. They rely on the beating of their legs to create a current which draws food particles into their shell that they'll form into a ball and then swallow. You can not only easily see their heartbeat circulatory system, but you can also readily see their digestive tract, though be it sometimes a little embarrassing. And you may notice that there's eggs inside this one. When the eggs hatch, the larva or young will actually stay within the mother for a little while. Like ostacods, the Daphnia are crustaceans. While discovering and observing freshwater macroinvertebrates is pretty exciting, they also serve as great indicators of water quality and the environment around it. There are some species that are really vulnerable to pollution and oxygen levels like the Helgramites, certain mayfly and caddisflies, um, even some of the sea shrimp and Daphnia. If those are present, you know the water quality is pretty decent. If all you're finding are snails and mosquito larvae, it's probably poor quality because they can breathe from the atmosphere above and they can tolerate fairly polluted bodies of water. Be sure to check out this video over here that YouTube has selected specifically for you based on your watch time. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button, but you gotta click the bell icon because if you don't, YouTube will never let you know when a new video of mine comes out.